Welcome to today's episode of Shrink for the Shag Guy. I'm your host, Dr. Aziz, and I'm excited because I'm going to be I'm going to be learning with you from a nervous system specialist named Johnny Miller. And I am particularly fascinated in what he teaches and helps people do, uh, which is how do you work with this thing, this body, this machine, this miracle gift that you've been given to uh, know how to operate it. And it's kind of a common phrase. People say there is no operating manual, but what if there were? And uh, Johnny has been studying this voraciously for thousands of hours. He has co-authored the Comprehensive Emotional Resilience and Leadership Report. Um, he has trained and mentored and coached people from high performers and professionals at companies like Google and Salesforce and Slack and helping people to learn how do you how do you operate when anxiety is high how do you learn to turn some of those dials that can feel in many ways out of control and uh, we'll get into it uh, I'm sure some in the interview but uh, Johnny also had an experience in 2017 uh, with his fiance that really set him on the course that he is today so um, Johnny thank you so much for for joining us mm, it's an absolute pleasure to be here yeah I'm excited for this Right on. So I definitely want to get into the the tools and and how to, you know, how do we regulate our nervous system? Um, and but also, you know, what what got you here? I mean, we read a little bit in your bio. Maybe you could tell us a little bit of like why why a nervous system specialist? Mm. Yeah, that's a great question. Um I think I've always been voraciously curious. I, I loved traveling. I started travel company about 10 years ago and about five and a half years ago that curiosity kind of got turned inwards um mm -hmm. and as you as you just mentioned in, in the intro there uh i i lost my fiance um she suffered from bipolar disorder mm -hmm. and one morning she was working as a junior doctor and she had an anxiety attack and she came home and there was no one at home. I, I was away at the time and she overdosed on her own medication. Um, and this, as you know, as you might imagine, just completely like broke me, broke me open, turned my life inside out, upside down. Um, and the process of moving through and surrendering to grief really just like it like opened up this like interior landscape that I hadn't been aware of previously I'd been very much like in my head and and interested and like philosophically curious about things but just honestly like quite numb from the neck down and once this, this grief started to move through me it also opened up other layers of things that were there and begun this um, this quest in a way to kind of understand like what what is going on <laughs> inside and that led me to meditation plant medicines um, breath work which is now a big part of my life and and really looking to understand the nervous system through the lens of things like polyvagal theory and, and other um, lenses to understand what's what's going on yeah wow and I think that's especially important for anyone who wants to have more confidence because uh, mm -hmm. you know, confidence is a byproduct of action. We have to take the risk to see there's some story I, you know, we have about ourselves. Oh, they're not going to like me. I'm not good enough for that. And we can do some affirmations. We can try to pump ourselves up, but the, the true path to confidence is to say, okay, let me see what happens when I go talk to that person. And you realize you can handle it or actually you get some positive responses, even though your mind only predicts negative. So people kind of hear that and they're like, all right, that makes sense. I'm okay. But then when it comes to it, there's beforehand all the anticipation, anxiety during, you know, you might freeze, you might freak out. Uh, even if you hide it well, it's like super unpleasant. And then afterwards, there might be a lot of arousal in the nervous system and, and then that manifests mm -hmm. in kind of a painful way of like self-judgment and rumination mm -hmm. and so i realize as i'm helping people build confidence a big part of what i need to do 
is help them work with their nervous system so they can mm -hmm. go take these risks. And so I'd love to hear, let's start with some of the basics. Like, okay, someone's like, I want to take more bold action in the world, but man, I just get so anxious mm. facing some of these mm. fears. You mentioned polyvagal theory. What are some of the core, like if you're to say, okay, there's a couple things you need to know to start to mm. work with this, this gift of a body. Uh, what, what would those things mm. be? Yeah, thank you. I, I love this question. And I actually, I was having a conversation with a, a previous student yesterday about how courage and self-conviction was like a really unexpected byproduct of of going through this training that, that we did ah. together and um well, you I have a lion a there in the background so there's a subtle there's a subtle uh, <laughs> reference there it's not the actually lion. mine he came oh. with the game with the room but uh oh, that's yeah, great. he's he's here <laughs> <laughs> yeah so um i i think one of the like crucial like distinctions and frameworks that like helps land some of this stuff for me is um, I don't know if your listeners are familiar with top down versus bottom up kind of interventions or protocols. And just to sum it up briefly, top down interventions are things like like positive reframes, affirmations, meditation, like things where you're using your mind to kind of like tell a different story mm -hmm. and show up differently. Mm -hmm. And those can certainly be effective. And what I found, at least for myself, is like when there is like so much activation energy in my system and, you know, my hand might be like quivering, it's it's really freaking hard to, to like mm. access that and mm. to, to kind of make those shifts in the nervous system when you're in this like high tone sympathetic state. Yeah, it sort and of so, often falls flat. It's like not convincing. It just feels like. Yeah, it's like it's, or, it's like we're trying to sell ourselves. Try something. again. And then the judgment comes back in and it's like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so what I've really enjoyed working with and what I found to be really empowering to share with people are these so-called bottom-up protocols, which, which basically means like working with your physiology first. And there's actually some quite interesting neuroscience behind this in that we have um, four times more neurons going from our body to our brain as we do from our brain to our body. So it's actually, it's like more effective to intervene at that level. Mm. Um, there, are, there are different protocols that, that you can use, um, but my favorite, and I think the, the kind of most effective is using the breath. And there are kind of three or four different core breathing practices that I teach, but the, the essential principle is having a longer exhale than your inhale. So mm. it might be inhaling for a count of four, exhaling for a count of eight or doing like a, a full breath in and then a sigh on the exhale so it's like and it's like this relaxed effortless sigh um another one that i like to use is is called the single breath hum that also has some great research behind it and it's basically again like a full inhale in and then like a mm, all the way to the end of the exhale mm. and you can you can combine these you can just kind of choose one um i sometimes i'll like do it in the bathroom sometimes if i'm at like a social uh, event mm -hmm. and i'm feeling like mm -hmm. overwhelmed or i use this before giving a tedx talk um that when i was i was terrified like <laughs> it was just like <laughs> i was shaking my, my mind had gone blank i was like judging myself and like three minutes of this just dropped me into this state of like complete calm and stillness and presence mm. and it's it's amazingly effective and i think it, it's one of the most like um like shocking like before and after effects because if you if you tune into your body before and then you do one of these breathing protocols and then tune in afterwards it's like it's like whoa like there's mm. just this like relaxation and another thing i like to talk about is how the way we breathe there's, there's a part of our brain that's basically spying on the way that we're breathing and if say if i'm talking to you now and i'm breathing like shallow in my upper chest like almost like panting it will activate my nervous system and then that will send signals to the endocrine system which releases certain hormones which then like reinforces the the thoughts and feelings that then create the breathing pattern so it's like this vicious cycle but if you change the breathing pattern it then sends signals to activate the parasympathetic nervous system which sends different hormones different changes in blood chemistry which then produces calmer thoughts and feelings and so I, I find it really interesting that instead of 
instead of intervening, we're like trying to force our way to think or feel differently. If we change the breath, that then changes the physiology, which which shifts the types of thoughts and feelings that just arise. Mm -hmm. So it's it's pretty magic. And then there's obviously other different um, bottom up protocols, like uh, you can intervene with your visual system. So kind of Andrew Huberman talks about optic flow and relaxing your gaze and almost having like a, a wider more panoramic view which mm. also has a similar effect um and, and and there's many more but that's the basic kind of principle that i like to share of intervening with 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 either bottom up or through co-regulation which is basically like how is our environment shaping our nervous system in each moment and that could be the people that we're with it could be are we in nature are we like looking at a blue sky are we in like a a busy subway you know like we're constantly being shaped by um the stimulus that's that's coming in as well yeah Ooh, well, i definitely want to talk more about about that one in a moment I, i've noticed that um mm -hmm. i i always well it really accelerated in uh 2020 when covid lockdowns were occurring i started to go out into nature more and then i started to get mm -hmm. this uh appetite for it uh, I, i'd always done stuff outside but you know a little bit here and there and it became like oh i want to spend all day on the mountain you know and we, it, it got so yeah. strong that we actually moved out into a forest about nine months ago and oh, wow. my desire to be outside it's just yeah i want to spend i try to get you know at least three hours a day outside if i can um and That's it's amazing. just this it feels like my body my nervous system from the bottom is drinking in something and i'm, I'm amazed <laughs> by it. it's like oh yeah i would actually want to spend like seven hours a day outside, you know, like yeah. logistically, it's hard to pull that off at this point. But yeah, um, so we'll talk more about that environment. I think that's really important. And, um, but let's do for those, I love this whole idea of bottom up. It's such a simple, understandable way. And those techniques, just a few you threw out there are really, really impactful and powerful and easy to remember, just like breathe out mm -hmm. longer than you breathe in, breathe in and mm -hmm. hum until you're done with the breath. Mm -hmm. Um, so when you're doing those, like before the Ted talk and you're kind of in the moment, you're stressing, mm. your mind's racing, what are yep. you doing during those couple minutes with the mind with, and it's going really fast. Are you trying to just focus mm. on the breath? Or are you just saying, Hey, do whatever you want. All I'm going to do is do this breath and let everything sort itself out. How do you, what do you do with your mm. focus during that time? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it's, it's more the latter. And there's also, uh, there's an interesting field of, I don't know if, if, you've heard of the alexander technique but you can um it's basically practices to expand your awareness so often when we're stressed out and anxious our awareness contracts into a more mm. narrow field and so if while we're breathing we can almost like be aware of the space behind us or be aware of the space to the sides and above that also adds to the kind of like calming safety effect that it's is created um, but generally I'll just like allow the mind to do whatever it wants, knowing that the, the breath will like, will calm it down very quickly, no matter what happens. Mm. Um, so, so yeah, I, I mean, as with mindfulness, like not getting dragged into a thought stream or something and just like allow the thoughts to arise, noticing them as they do. Yeah. That's really interesting. I didn't know. Um, I'd heard of the term uh, Alexander technique, but I didn't. I didn't wasn't familiar with it. I didn't know that that's was was one of their components. I, the whole becoming mm. more aware of the space around you is something that I just came mm. upon by spending more time outdoors and realizing one of the reasons that it feels good to me is there's a spaciousness to it. There's a sense yes. of expansiveness, and I was like, oh well, how do I get that more everywhere? And it was that exactly. I realized, and especially with with meditation, if I I feel like there's something about going really super inward that actually can create more of a, a lower energy state or a more negative or loops. But if I'm aware, but I start with mm -hmm. or allow the awareness to go way outside my body and almost yes. like the room that I'm in, but I even let it go further to yep. through the walls and the ceiling that all of a sudden I can focus inward in a much more just a better way it's not like a mental exactly grinding scratching kind of way yeah exactly so I, i've been in conversations with my friend michael who teaches the alexander technique and uh i have a th i have a hypothesis i guess that the the state in which our awareness is expanded is correlated to the state of ventral vagal which is basically like our social safety 
the social engagement branch of the nervous system, which is what we're accessing when we're doing these breathing practices, when we're when we're kind of taking these big sighs, like that's using, it's like bringing us into ventral vagal tone. And my my experience, at least, is that when my awareness is very expansive, it's it's using that same part of the of the nervous system as well. Interesting. Can you say more about that and the ventral vagal nerve in general, just to mm. kind of describe what what's what that uh, yeah. function of that is? And yeah, totally. So this is um this is drawing from polyvagal theory, which is the work of doc, Dr. Stephen Porch. Um, it's it's an amazing amazing kind of lens through which to view life, honestly. And uh, the 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 basic kind of distilled version is there are three branches of the nervous system. There's the sympathetic, which a lot of people have heard of, is like the fight flight activation intensity. Mm -hmm. Um, then there are two branches of the parasympathetic. Sorry, my puppy is <laughs> puppy's on the loose. <laughs> chewing on my feet right now. <laughs> um, yeah, so that there's two branches of the parasympathetic nervous system that known as the dorsal and the ventral vagal. The dorsal is like the handbrake. So it's it's like the fuse. It's like when there's too much energy in the system and we, we, we you know we can't take it, it's like we go into collapse. It's like shut down, freeze like just like overwhelm and it's also where depression tends to live and these kind of more like um inward kind of sensations and then ventral vagal is the the social engagement or like like when we feel safe when we feel like mm. we're connecting deeply with other people when we're in nature um like nature is a great way of getting us into this ventral vagal system like when i'm cuddling my puppy that's down here and, and it, she's not biting my feet <laughs> like that's like that's that's ventral vagal and 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 the, the breathing practices too it's like sending signals to our body that like we're safe we can engage with other people be social have our awareness be expansive um and and this is often what i think a lot of the nervous system work comes down to is like retraining this ventral vagal branch of being able to feel um, relaxed and safe in different environments. And the ventral and dorsal, those are just references to which uh, part of the anatomy of this particular nerve is activated or is being used? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, the the dorsal kind of neurons are more down in our like, like pelvic floor, like this kind of area. Uh -huh. um and the the ventral is more like kind of the right side of the neck going down into the, into the heart and you can even put put a hand on on your on your neck and like imagine that you're feeling into like the ventral branch which is part of the vagus nerve yeah wow that's really fascinating and that sense of relaxed i'm safe and connected to others is you know essential for for social confidence and that's really getting into that state and that's kind of what the whole purpose of the exposure work and the training is like how can i approach social interactions mm -hmm. as you know f instead of from this uh sympathetic i'm going to die state or there's a high risk mm -hmm. here is helping mm -hmm. retrain people to see like well actually i'm not at risk right now even if they don't like exactly. me that's okay. I'm not, gonna, yeah. you know, and so I think there's some retraining and really getting into that ventral state where it sounds like the dorsal ventral is more, or dorsal uh, vagal is more, um, this kind of self, it's a self-protection of a different kind. You know, one self-protection mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. like run or fight. And the other self-protection is collapse or freeze or fawn maybe. Ex exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And, and with, with the dorsal, um, it's when it's kind of like low tone or like not intensely activated, it's more like rest and digest, like deep sleep is, is dorsal. Mm. Um, and it's, it's also worth noting that like these two or three of them can be online at the same time. So like, like right. when we're feeling in deep states of flow, that's like sympathetic and ventral at the same time where we're activated, but we also feel safe. We also feel like focused and, and like alive. Wow. That's really interesting. And I think uh, very helpful too to just remember some of these tools because I find sometimes uh, I will be let's say I'll like last night I was teaching a group call you know or going long almost goes three hours and I leave and I'm just uh -huh. like in this energy rich state I'm like ah but it's time for bed you know and uh, so I'm up <laughs> for two hours uh -huh. and I think I it's helpful for me to remember some yeah. of these tools because sometimes I'll think of them when I'm feeling bad you know I'm I'm stressed out I'm anxious. But when I'm feeling yeah. energized, it kind of feels good. And it's like a little yeah. kid. He's like, I don't want to go to bed. Yeah. But <laughs> that there's still yeah. like a, a 
it's not the time to be fully on and aroused and ready to go. It's yeah. the time to start to send totally. a calming message. Totally. Yeah. The, the, the states tend to be quite sticky in the sense that like when we're in sympathetic, it feels good to stay in that. Or when we're in dorsal, it feels good to like go into whatever that sensation is. Yeah. Um, yeah I, I mean, I'm, I'm the same, like my partner and I, I try and we have like a hot bath in the evenings or we go stretch doing some breathing practices as we stretch as well. Um, yeah, it's, it's really helpful to, and just get into a routine of these things as well. Cause otherwise it's like, like you say, like when you're feeling like, Oh, I feel so great. I've got so much energy, but it's like midnight. It's like, well, I'll probably regret this in the morning. In the morning yeah. Yeah. Morning is easy. It's like, dude, um, yeah, yeah. Well, that's, that's another key point, uh, about setting up rituals or how to get ourselves to do this. Cause there may be resistance. So we'll talk about that in a moment, but first let's go back to, um, the, this idea of co-regulating with the environment around you, because mm. let's, there's this interesting, uh, you know, multiple perspectives can be true. So it's another, it's always never, it's not just one thing or the other. Right. But on the one hand, there's, there's a sense of like, well, the environment I'm in, of course, is going to have a big effect on me. And so sometimes the best thing you can do to take care of yourself is change the environment or get out. You know, if you're in an abusive relationship, get out of the environment, you know, but at the same time, though, sometimes people will be the victim of their circumstance and their environment where it's like, well, mm -hmm. you know, I don't like being in groups of people. So I guess I'm just never going to go to that kind of stuff. And mm -hmm. so let's talk about this idea of, of correlating with the environment and how do we find our own agency and empowerment while at the same time we are affected by the environments that we're in yeah i think it's it's a really beautiful question and that there is this like inherent tension in the question and the, the way that i teach this and think about it for myself is developing like complete agency just give me one sec i'm gonna let, sure. let out the puppy puppy's on the loose <laughs> <laughs> You normally get to walk at this time. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I, I think about this both in terms of um, knowing that like no matter what environment we're in, we are capable of down-regulating, down-shifting and, and accessing that place of calm. And at the same time, um, I have this idea that, that we design our environments and then our environments design us in return. Mm. So we have agency over creating the types of space that we're in knowing that the the stimulus that we're receiving is going to be impacting us all of the time so for example um you know designing your bedroom to be kind of conducive to sleep maybe having like salt lamps and relaxing music and kind of lavender incense that kind of like that's going to create the conditions for sleep to emerge and likewise, if you're in, if you if you live in a city and you like walk out on a busy street with lots of noises, that's also going to be impacting your nervous system, and there will be a tendency to to go into that more sympathetic state. Mm -hmm. So, so I th I think for me, it, it's like it's about being intentional, and it's about designing your environment that is conducive to the states that you want to feel um, in your own life, mm -hmm. um, and at the same time having the tools to upregulate or downregulate if you need to, like, if you find your, you know, if you go traveling, if you're at an airport, like whatever it is, like life happens, we can't control our environments the whole of the time. Mm -hmm. um, but for, you, you know, I mean, like you were saying earlier, like having a, a practice of like spending a good amount of time in nature, like is amazing. And that will impact your nervous system over time as well. Mm -hmm. You mentioned up regulating there. What, what is, exactly is mm -hmm. that? And when would we want to do that? Yeah, great question. So I, I did it this morning, just before this podcast. Um, it's basically like when we are in a kind of state of like, like lethargy, like maybe like low tone uh -huh. dorsal, maybe we've just had a big meal. And instead of, you know, drinking two double espressos, you could do something like like bellows breathing or breath of fire, which is a more activating breath practice, or you could do, you know, do a workout, something like that, cold plunge, and it creates more adrenaline and cortisol in the system, which gives us like energy when we need it mm. um so I, i'll have a practice usually in the morning kind of sauna cold plunge and then simple breathing practices to kind of get into that more energized state um yeah and then the the downshifting practices more in the afternoon when i'm looking to kind of like unwind from the day yeah 
which which uh which one is um so the the breath pattern that wim hof popularized where it's mm. you know 30 ish fully in and letting go breaths and then a and then a, yep. a big hold at the end is that one because uh-huh. i feel like that one for me when i do it it's i will feel a mixture of energized and calm afterwards so i don't yeah, know if i'm upgrading sure. or downgrading <laughs> with that one yeah, yeah it's um I I actually I tend to stay away from recommending Wim Hof to many people in that because it's so intensely activating for people who have a a proclivity towards anxiety things like that or panic attacks it can really destabilize people mm. um, and I've spoken to many students who've had uh, almost like like long term dysregulation as a result of doing too much Wim Hof mm. um, so I tend to recommend a a slightly like lighter um uh breathwork practice that's just through the nose if you're breathing in and out through the mouth it's it's very activating um so it f- for some people that have healthy nervous systems then yeah it can definitely have that energized but also calm but if if you're someone that you you know maybe you have a tendency towards depression or towards being overactive or burnout then i i'd really uh, I, I wouldn't recommend Wim Hof, certainly not on a, on a regular basis. Mm-hmm. So what would you, let's say someone wants to get into a more energized, but not, mm-hmm. you know, uh, I don't know, agitated, sort of ener- calm, but energized oh. state. You said something about the yep. nose. What, what, what technique would you recommend for that? Yeah, so one simple one is, uh, it's called bellow, Bellows Breath or Kapalabhati in like the, the yogic world. And it's basically 30 rapid exhales through the nose and kind of pump using the belly as a pump so i could could do a little demonstration now it's like so you're kind of pulling the so on on the exhale the belly is coming in and it's like pumping pulling the the belly towards the spine yeah exactly and then the breath is coming out the nose and then you're just breathing in through the nose to re- to replenish the breath. So it's like in, out, in, out. The, the inhale happens naturally. Yeah, you don't yeah, have to like an automatic worry about response the inhale. to that. And you exactly. do like 30 then, of those or something? Yeah, usually about 30. And then I'll do um, either hold on the exhale for 10, 15 seconds. And then I'll either do a few sighs or I'll do alternate and off to breathing, which is like inhaling through the left side for four, holding for four, exhaling through the right for eight. And then inhaling right for four, holding for four, exhaling through the left for, for, for eight. And then that's like one round. And then, you know, maybe I'll do two rounds, maybe three rounds. And yeah, that's for me, that's a kind of like more um, stabilizing, grounding way of, of energizing the body. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And the um, the alternating. So because I know that's that's from a yoga uh, tradition as well. So that I mean, it's got the longer exhale. Mm-hmm then inhale so that's going to mm-hmm. have that calming effect what do you mm-hmm. what is your understanding of the alternating of the nostrils and what the benefit of that is mm. yeah there, there's been a, a couple of studies on this nothing that's i'd say is like conclusive but my guess is that, that by only breathing through one side you're um, narrowing the aperture in which the breath can come in which is increasing the amount of co2 in the body um which which kind of has has this effect and there've also been some studies that show that the the left nostril is correlated with the with the right hemisphere and the right nostril with the left hemisphere and that there's almost this like balancing of the hemispheres effect going on that's that hasn't been like con- conclusively shown through studies but it's it's like a theory sure um i sure. i just i notice in myself that it feels uh it's more effective if i use the alternate nostril version yeah it also has the just the on the surface level effective gives you something to focus on and do so mm-hmm. it can be more mm-hmm. uh, narrowing of that focus to to help it get off of whatever you might be doing with your focus. yeah it's less helpful it, than that. exactly it, yeah that's exactly. an interesting tip about the the wim hof thing i think i think there's a part of me that that's helpful to have some because sometimes i don't it's almost it feels like a oh that's a big output it's like a workout to mm-hmm. do that round and also though i think there is something about uh I'm a, I am fascinated by altered states of consciousness. I think they're interesting to go into and explore and growthful. And there's something mm-hmm. about that kind of intense 
breathing with the breath hold that creates that access to uh especially when i'm mm-hmm. in the middle of the the longer breath hold it's something's different and there's a part of me that's mm-hmm. like I like this <laughs> so um <laughs> but i can yeah. see how it's uh you want to have other uh tools other gears because that is definitely like a high gear practice yeah. right so on that note i mean i i love um what's known as like like transformational breathwork journeys where there's like a 60 to 90 minute container and there's a breathing practice with a playlist with people holding space where you really do get to access those altered states and and that's actually where i think a lot of the the deep work gets us to access the root of some of these anxieties challenges that we have sometimes sometimes traumas um and the the practice that i use is known as conscious connected breathing and it's basically a full inhale and then a relaxed exhale and i'll be lying down often there's someone there to provide physical support to help like create ease in the breath as well and by looping the breath in this way um, it basically creates a bridge to the subconscious and subconscious Mm -hmm. material tends to rise up either in the form of of memories from from my childhood from from the past or just uh, incomplete reflexes Um, and you know sometimes like my right arms might start moving or my feet might start pedaling or anger might want to come through or fear and it's mm-hmm. for me it's really a beautiful arena for accessing like the full spectrum of, of human emotions mm-hmm. um, and it, it, it's like it's increasing my capacity to feel in all of these different areas and so for you know many years I I was just never angry I was like I'm I'm just not an angry person I'm just really calm <laughs> all the time mm-hmm. and anger came up in a big way in one of these breathwork journeys and I remember my my guide at the time, he said, like, you are loved in your anger. And I just like burst into tears. I just started like bawling and, and crying and realized that I'd like shut myself off from feeling that way because I, I thought it made me a bad person. Mm-hmm. Um, and these this form of breathwork has helped me process grief. It's helped me go into shame in a, in a healthy way. Um, so I, I really find that style of breathwork, which is more of this like, kind of deliberate journey um to be just very it's it's changed my life honestly it's it's really made a difference yeah wow it, if some so this there's the kind of the facilitated format do would you recommend someone who's curious uh to i'm sure like on youtube or someplace uh you know following mm. along on their own or would you say that that's they'd want to get more of a support or more of a container uh, first mm. yeah I, I mean i so i did kind of explore on my own to begin with um but as a as a practitioner myself i definitely would recommend ideally like one-on-one guided support in the beginning to kind of get a sense for for feeling safe in that space and like staying in your body like during the experiences as, as well um and or kind of small group containers can also be really powerful Um, but just making sure that the practitioner is trauma aware is aware of how the nervous system works because there are certain breath work experiences where people will just like blast intense music say like huff and puff as hard as you can and people might have these like psychedelic like experiences but i don't think it's really serving them in the long run it's just like overriding their nervous system they often check out of their body and then Mm -hmm. come back in and it can in some cases it can re-traumatize Mm. um so i i tend to recommend finding a a practitioner to work one-on-one with especially in the beginning and then over time for sure like having your own self-practice yeah and so the one that you uh conscious connected breathing was that what you called it Mm. yeah so i I was actually trained (laughs) it's a bit of a mouthful it's called facilitated breath repatterning or fbr for short um, I, I interviewed my teacher about this on my own podcast, if anyone's curious, but um, it's basically using conscious connected breathing, which is just this like circular looping breath, like a full inhale and then a relaxed exhale to um, build more freedom and explore different breathing rhythms in, in the body and the nervous system. Mm-hmm. And then their, their theory is that different breathing rhythms correlate with different emotional expressions. And so if we're unable to breathe in a certain way, then it's likely we're unable to feel whatever that emotion is. And so by 
going in gently by having that like ventral vagal tone that sense of safety we're able to go into these more uncomfortable places and build safety in in that mm. Wow, that's fascinating. And with that starting breath, I know it sounds like you explore other patterns, but the starting one, are you, um, maybe if you'd be able to demo just a few of those breaths, are you sort of straining like fully in or just like a comfortably in and then out? Is there a certain pace you're trying to maintain? Um, I'm curious, the, yeah. the, the few breathwork things I've done, uh, journeys like that, and maybe this is just the nature of the beast, uh, pretty uncomfortable in the sense that I wanted to stop <laughs> and it was like mm. I don't um mm. and it's kind of like yeah the first five ten minutes are just like a workout like you might not want to feel like mm. running but you just get yourself running and then you you know like it now for me uh running is like that it's very self-reinforcing and I know that um I mean it's got all it's got all the greats right I'm, I, I never run on a treadmill so I'm always outside no matter the weather and I'm, my breathing mm -hmm. gets really regulated because I focus on it often when I'm running. And uh, nice. and so, yeah, within no matter how much I'm resisting it, being in the warm house, the, you know, within <laughs> three minutes of being outside, I'm like, oh, this is I'm so glad I did this. Whereas yeah. with the breathwork journey, I found that it's kind of like a um, there's like an efforting to do the breathing, but I'm not doing a physical yeah. activity that that makes me just want to breathe deeper like that. And so there's like sure, a propping sure. it up. And that might be, again, I'm curious if that's the nature of the beast or that's just the style that I was using or what are your thoughts? Yeah. About that? Yeah. So th this is definitely, it's like a big topic to go and see, but the short answer is there are versions of breathwork like holotropic, which was developed by Stan Groff, who yeah. is an amazing human being. And I also don't believe that like that style of forced inhale and forced exhale is like serving the nervous system. And so conscious connected breathing is it's like an inhale as far as you're comfortable and it's almost like going through gears so you start off in like first gear second gear and then as the music ramps up you find yourself naturally inhaling more and accessing more of that like the upper part of the lungs mm. um so i mean to demonstrate briefly you'd be you'd be lying down obviously but the principles are open mouth relaxed body the top of the inhale meets the exhale the bottom of the exhale meets the inhale so it's like circular with no pauses at the top of the bottom and then it's like a vibrant inhale whatever vibrant means to you and then a relaxed effortless exhale so i i'm a free diver i have quite a big lung capacity so my mm. inhales are quite vibrant but it's it's always easeful and and whenever we are over efforting or like pushing ourselves that's a sign that we're like holding on to something um, or that there's something to kind of relax into and and this often shows up in our lives too like when I when I breathe in that way there's a chance that I'm like I'm like forcing my way through life or I'm like gripping on tightly or I'm, I'm like afraid to let go and it's interesting how I think like the way that we breathe does have these it's almost like a mirror to like the patterns that we have in in life as well mm. yeah I, I think that's a another important I don't know, again, know it's a tool or just a, a, a reminder or practice is to be aware of our breath throughout the day at different times, mm -hmm. as opposed to just, oh, I'm going to pay attention while I'm doing this exercise. And I, it, my sense is that if you are having a couple, you know, little few sessions during the day where you're intentionally focusing on your breath, that you're more likely to mm -hmm. bring your awareness to it during the day as well to, 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 yeah. um, to just to, to be to know how to influence things in the moment rather than letting totally. the pattern yeah. play out and i don't know what's going on but now i'm irritated and sad yeah <laughs> yeah I, I think that's a beautiful that's a beautiful point and something that i i'm really passionate about talking about is this idea of interoception and somatic awareness and like noticing the early signs of a reactive pattern so you know a lot of people they, it might not be until they like shout at their partner or they lose their shit at work. But if you can like be tuned into your body, you'll start to notice of like, oh, I'm feeling this like tension or heat in my chest. And that is usually correlates with I then lose my shit at someone. Mm. Um, and so the more of this like somatic awareness or interoception, as it's known, um, the more that we can be aware of our like early tendencies or early warning signs of going into reactivity in certain forms and like intervene earlier while it's it's easier and you can kind of catch it and you can calm down but once you're 
once you're past a certain point it's pretty hard to like reel yourself in you know like once you've once you've gone into that like hulk mode or whatever the whatever the pattern is yeah which brings me back to something that i wanted to make sure we circle back to i guess there's kind of two sides to this one is around uh practices and how uh staying consistent with them the other is Mm -hmm. okay in the moment when this would be a good thing for me to do uh sometimes there's a part of us that's like no i don't wanna and we either tell ourselves it's not going to (laughs) work which is total bs but Uh we just or there's just like Uh i don't i don't want to do it calm down you know i don't want to so um yeah uh and and i think one way to help uh, us stay with a practice is when we can link it to something awesome. So you, you mentioned uh, Andrew Huberman, right? Earlier in the- Huberman. Mm-hmm. Huberman, yeah. He mm-hmm. uh, he said something a while back that really got me. So I'd done, you know, cold uh, showers and stuff for a number of years, but I don't know, there's about a six month period where I was real <laughs> uh, loose with it. So I'd, you know, I'd end my nice hot shower with 10 seconds of cold and be like, I did it. I did it. You uh-huh. see that everybody. Right? <laughs> so Then I was listening to him uh-huh. and he was talking about creating the conditions of summer inside of your body. So this idea, like, you know, we all mm. feel good when we walk outside and it's summertime and it's, that's naturally happening. And then you go outside when it's cold and the win- winter and you're like, Bleh. and he's like, but you can actually create those conditions. And so it's, you know, getting sunlight pretty soon as you mm-hmm. can upon waking and, uh, and doing yep. the, cold exposure and so just that that little framing of making it summertime in my body i'm like okay and so Mm -hmm. as soon as i heard that i got back on to you know doing a cold purely cold shower every day and it's sure Mm -hmm. it's it works so what would you say is that uh impact that 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 can sort of make us want to do these practices to really link it to something uh, mm. so what, what is the effect, would you say, of having a regular practice of working with our breath on purpose each day? Yeah. Um, this is a great question. And I, I've, I've read a lot about kind of behavior change and, you know, James Clear's like idea around habit formation. And I think there's a lot there, but I think for me, the fundamental piece is like, is like find a way to enjoy it. And often for me, that's like tuning into my body and realizing that like, I feel really good during and after. So Mm. when it comes to like doing it, there's not really any resistance because it's like, I'll feel really good like Mm -hmm. (laughs) during and after this. And even in something like ice baths, um, there is that initial shock, but very quickly it's like, oh, like this, even the intensity, it, it feels really good if you yeah. like really tune into your body. Um, it's more of like when we're out of our body, we're in the stories, it's like, oh, oh I want to go out, I want to go start my day, like whatever it is. But if you're in your body, it's like, no, I feel alive. Like this is like invigorating. Yes. Um, so, so for me, it, it's like giving people experiences of whether it's these breathing practices whether it's like nsdr that huberman talks about as well which i'm a huge fan of um and i find that when people are tuned into their body and the sen- the, the actual sensations then they really start to enjoy it and it, it's more when they're like in their minds or in their heads or they think about what they want to be doing next that that resistance comes online um and related to that like if there is a voice that's like like i don't want to do this then then like feel that like go into the body like where is that voice coming from and like feel that resistance and like go into it all the way Mm. and don't like reject it but just like invite it as like another thing to to experience Mm. um and and this of course i think it does take some time and practice and in the beginning accountability structure definitely helps but over time the more that we're like tuned into the sensations of our body or like the somatic awareness the more we just trust that and the more it becomes like a like a compass and like a guiding way we orient through life like whether we say yes to certain things how we make decisions how we like what we eat you know all this stuff instead of like mentally trying to figure it out it's like does this feel good in my body do i feel expansive do i feel alive do i feel drawn to this Mm. um which i think is a radical rewiring from how many of us grew up at least certainly speaking for myself where i was very in my head with everything <laughs> and i made spreadsheets to, to make decisions and all all that stuff 
Um, but that's, I think that's been one of the biggest gifts for me in this work. Yeah. I love that. And you mentioned several times cold plunge. Do you have a cold plunge that you set up? And if so, what, what kind is it? So I've been looking at those. Yeah, so like, I, oh, do I want to do like the DIY chest freezer thing? And I'm like, ah, oh, I don't know. <laughs> and it's another thing to maintain in my house. So I'm curious what, what you got going uh -huh. on over there. Yeah, so I, I just did the DIY chest freezer thing. I bought a chest freezer for, I think it was like $500, put some like sealant in the inside and then uh -huh. and, um, that's pretty much it, honestly. And then just keep it at a, a consistent temperature. So you have timer. like water so pumps it's... to circulate the water and all that stuff? I, I don't, I just re, I empty the water every two or three weeks and that, and, and put in some, um, it's like hydrogen peroxide, I think, just to keep oh. the water from going bad. Uh, oh. well, that's it's the same easier. stuff that they, they put in hot, hot tubs. Yeah. That's the easiest approach. You can, there's some companies, I think they charge like four or $5,000 for, I'm like, no, I'm not no, gonna... if, dude, that's <laughs> true with everything in life. If you can just DIY it, it's, it's astronomical. Yeah. The difference. Yeah. Right. The thing or, I was or looking I mean, at, oh, go ahead. You can also just use a like sometimes if we don't have that, we'll just like run a cold bath and the, the water here is very cold. So that also. Yeah, that's the uh, that's the, the 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 quick and easy approach. Yeah, I mean, if, if you don't, the one I was looking at, like they're drilling through the uh, freezer wall to run their wire, their pump lines. And I'm just like, well, oh, I don't know about all that. So mm. Um, mm. but the idea, if, if you can just uh, cycle out, you know, so how do you. We're not going to turn this into it, <laughs> a make your own cold plunge podcast. But one last question, because <laughs> I am curious about it. Uh -huh. uh, if you're draining the water. If it's inside your house, how are you draining the water? It's outside. It's, it's on the, outside. The patio. Do you do you yeah, have to worry about the temperature, the ambient temperature around the freezer d damaging it? Like if it gets too cold. Sometimes it it really damages it. I think it did get really cold here at some point, and then it it just turned into ice inside, and I just smashed through the ice, and that was fine. Uh, <laughs> you just get maybe a freezer yeah, it's that's a bit ready of a... to go down to freezing temperatures or something. Yeah, it, yeah. precisely. Yeah, like a meat All freezer. Right. Well, that's because I, I mean I do the cold showers, but I'm like, man, the cold plunge yeah. is a whole nother level. It's another level. Yeah. yeah. And especially yeah. if you have like some kind of like, like a, a sauna or like a steamer, something like that, it, it's, it feels great. It's one you of my start favorite with practices. that and then go into the cold. Yeah. Usually some kind of workout, then 10 minutes in the, in the hot sauna and then the cold and maybe do two or three runs. Yeah. Oh, sad. Now you're talking. All right. I'll, I'll look into the, uh, <laughs> the, 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 the simple DIY approach, but I, I and, can send some YouTube videos that were. Yeah. Helpful. Yeah. Please do. Please do. Um, and you mentioned, uh, a couple of things. So you mentioned you had your own podcast. What's the name of that podcast? Mm -hmm. Yeah. My podcast is called curious humans. Um, it's been going for a few years and I, I love it. Yeah. I kind of have conversations like this, honestly, with people who are, experts in different areas of life things that do relate to the nervous system but also outside of that as well um yeah awesome okay so curious humans and people could find mm -hmm. that on you know apple Podcasts, that sort of thing all, all of the usual podcast platforms okay. yeah great great and then also you have um nsmastery.com and it's a nervous mm. system mastery course. So can you tell us just a little bit about, so for those who are listening, you're like, wow, uh, I know we're just scratching the surface here and you want to really learn these tools in depth. Uh, can you tell us more about that nervous system mastery course? Yeah, thank you. So it's um, it's a cohort-based program. It's five weeks long. The next cohort is running in spring. So April 10th, I believe is the start date. And it's uh, it's basically my attempt to distill everything that I've learned into a kind of like, practical curriculum so sharing the protocols of breathing emotional fluidity self-regulation practices ways mm. to build interoception um, and also inviting in other guest speakers who are experts in different domains to share their own modalities q a's hot seat coaching it's, it's kind of like an intensive experience um but i really enjoy doing it and if this conversation has resonated with with anyone um please do check it out the applications are yeah they're open right now so uh, feel Perfect. free to get in touch. Okay. That's great. Well, Johnny, thank you so much for sharing these insights. And uh, just a very, I think one of the things that's most inspiring is not just the information you're sharing, but you know, you live this stuff. And I know we were scheduling this interview and you're like, oh, I can't do it during that week. I'm going to be at a meditation retreat. Like, so there's a way that you're really 
uh, mm -hmm. living this. And I think that's the most impactful way that teachers uh, mm -hmm. affect people, right? Because there's what you teach mm -hmm. and the tools, but then there's also this transmission of who you are. So very inspiring. I feel mm -hmm. that talking to you. So I'm inspired. I'm inspired to get that cold plunge going and to do some of these uh, <laughs> breathwork practices, which I've you know been off and on again with. But I think the one thing that I see I was missing is I I gravitated towards more of the intense stuff, right? Like, all right, we're going to sit mm -hmm. down and go to gear four. I don't want yeah. to, you know? <laughs> and uh, so I love, love this. Just I'm going to multiple times just do the longer out than in. Seems like a very easy entry point. I know there's so much more. So definitely encourage uh, anyone listening who's drawn to this to check out the Nervous System Mastery course. Awesome. Beautiful. Thank you so much, well, thank, you, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, this was an absolute pleasure. Um, we'd love to love to stay in touch. Sounds good.